And they did. Well, they, they didn't abduct me, but they tried. Even that time, I have never, ever had a trip that was as difficult as this one. Ever. I gotta be honest with you, I don't know why, except for the fact that it was warfare. I mean, I, I know why more now. <laughs> there, there are very few ways that the enemy can hit me. Alexis has told you that before. Very few ways that he can, I don't want to say stop me, but slow me down. And headaches are one of those ways. I developed a headache from pretty much the moment I got there. And I kept it through yesterday morning. But at times, it got so bad I couldn't see. I remember the day that we had all these groups there. We had over 25 people. 25 people, all representing a total of, I believe it was including us, five American ministries. Had them all down at the compound for the first time. All see, or sorry, the campus. We're trying to change that. It's no, no longer compound, it is now campus. Anyways, having them there, seeing what God is doing, seeing what God wants to do, his plans, his vision, it, 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 was, it was amazing how God put that together. It wasn't us that put it together. I mean, we stewarded what God did. And the schedule was insane. I mean, pretty much every minute of our time there was taken up by something. And I remember the day that we took, because we were down in McCurdy for three days was all, because then we also went up to Joss, which is the first time I had ever been to Joss myself. And I remember the, uh, the first full day, no, it would have been the second full day that we were in McCurdy, we, we traveled around to all these different places. That was the day we went to the IDP camp. We, we took them to our headquarters land that had been um, uh, anointed and, and what the plans were there. Um, the day before, we had gone through visions, so they, they had seen everything that God intends for these places. And I, I remember by the time we got to the land, and that was before we even went out to the IDP camps, by the time we got to the land, I was having trouble seeing. And my head hurt so bad. And I just remember leaving there thinking, you know, maybe they could just drop me off. <laughs> And, and, I mean, do they really need me at the IDP camp? You know, I mean, they're going to be absorbed in what's going on there. And, and I felt, no, I, I need to be a part of everything they're doing, everything they're absorbing, because we're going to have conversations about this. So I need to be there. And I remember going to these camps and, and not being able to pour out like I wanted to but literally just being there as a witness. Because that, that's, that's almost all I could do. And not even so much a witness that was seeing, <laughs> but a witness that was feeling in the spirit, that was hearing, that was trying to give support to what many people were experiencing for the first time in their lives. See, most people have no clue what it's like in this sort of depravity. And I don't mean depravity because of the people living there. I mean depravity of those who put them there in the first place. It was a, a tough scene. And it was tough on these Americans that were there. Needed, but tough. These people that for years, years, had been advocating for the very thing that they had not seen in person. 
And for those of you, many in here have been there. Many know what I'm talking about. When you walk into an IDP camp and you, you see the children and you see the people and you hug the kids and you actually see that they smile, man, that messes with your head. It really does. They have nothing to smile for. And yet they do. They sit there and they sing about Jesus because he is the only thing to smile for. Well, it wrecked these people. It did. And we went on from there. We, we were there one more day in McCurdy. Then we went on up to Joss and man, so much happened. <laughs> I can't even tell you. So much happened. But all along the way, we felt your prayers. I felt your prayers. It's what sustained us. And you know what the Lord told me yesterday as I, as I tried to, I think I only had two appointments yesterday, so I, I tried to just, no wait, yesterday was Saturday. Friday, sorry. I chilled as much as I could on Friday. Um, and then also after the gifts meeting yesterday, and I was talking to the Lord about what this means. And, you know, why was it so hard? You know, I mean, really, come on. You know, Lord, you could heal my neck. If, if my neck were fine, if I did not have a headache that time, it would have been a very different experience for me. I mean, really, how, how many times do we think about that? In our own lives, things that we have to go through for some reason, you know, do I have to go through this? Lord, why? Why did Paul pray three times, get rid of this spirit, rid of this oppression, rid of this thing that is on him? And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Why? Why? <laughs> it's because when you birth something, when you birth something new, it takes effort. There's a cost. There's a cost because it's not supposed to cost in the future. Jesus paid for our sin so we didn't have to pay for our sin. So we can receive his free gift to be seen sinless by the Father. See, he went through that birth canal for us. That doesn't relieve us of any responsibility <laughs> because he has our own callings on our life for the birth canals we're supposed to go through. And that's what the Lord showed me is this trip was just that. It was a birth canal. It was a transition from one period to another. One time to another time. A transition of phase, if you will. And it was so beautiful how he confirmed that for me. You know, one of the most precious things to me, I, I talk to the Lord all the time, love his voice, love the conversations we have, but when I hear him speak to me from somebody else that has no clue what he's talking about, but they just act in obedience and they do it, that means more to me than you can imagine. And that happened Friday morning. It wrecked me. I'm going to read it to you because I believe it is applied to ignition. Not just me. Because we have gone through a birth canal. We are entering into a different phase. And, and I really, I'm going to do my best to get through this. But I want you to recognize, even if you weren't in Nigeria, even if you were sitting here or you were at home and you were praying and you were fighting in the spirit, you were every bit as part of that trip as we were. You were a part of that formidable army that I'll tell you what, Satan is afraid of. 
He is afraid of it. So this is what the Lord said. And again, it's, it's, it's written to me, but apply it to ignition. My son, you are about my work. You have set your hand to the plow and have not looked back. Because you have believed, my kingdom is advancing on the earth and my will is being done. You bring hope and comfort to those in need. There is great joy in my heart to see you faithfully doing my will. A new chapter in your journey is beginning. I am continuing to work in you and through you to declare and decree my desire for the land. Remember, this is all about taking land. That's what it's all about. New relationships will come about. I, give, I will give you new revelation concerning my plans and purposes. You will pick up and you will let go. You will give and you will receive. I have prepared you and will continue preparing you for much. Out of humility and the fear of the Lord, you will know riches, honor, and life. You have chosen to lose your life for my sake, so you have found my life for your sake. Remain at rest in me. Much will be happening in the natural. It is an outgrowth of what was birthed in the spirit realm. My anointing will increase within you and without from you. Stay close to me. We have work to do. I will strengthen you for the ministry ahead. Keep your eyes on me. The faith I have given you is moving mountains. I love you, my dear son, your Abba Father. Please apply that to those in ignition that are fully engaged to those who have taken on this mantle of doing his will. We're coming into a new phase. We're coming into a new time. And I'll tell you, <laughs> many things I can't say online. So come Tuesday, because <laughs> I'll talk about them then. What has happened over the last couple of weeks will blow your mind. Doors that have been opened that we've been knocking on for years that opened. Doors that we had no idea somebody was knocking on. We weren't. They opened. They opened wide. We had no part in it. It was God that did everything. And, and we'll talk about that more on Tuesday. We'll talk about that. We talked about it a little bit yesterday even in the gifts meeting, but... I just want to encourage you for what is going on. The, the Lord said that things would happen in Nigeria first. You know when the Lord says something and, and it's like that could apply to a million things. And every time that I think we're done with that phrase, it just keeps happening over and over again, right? But that's what he's doing. Our voice is rising in Nigeria the voice that the Lord said would rise globally, it's already beginning. It's already happening. It's already doing it. I mean, when you hear some of these things, I, I think you'll, you'll just be blown away. But uh, just trying to think if there was anything else that I wanted to mention about this trip. Just be in prayer. There's... Oh, man, there's just so much to it. I, I will say this, just to give you an idea, because, and I, I am not, Lord, I will not dovetail off in this. I'll, I'll be quick, because <laughs> this isn't what he wanted to talk about tonight or this morning. But 
I got to mention this. We, we started a new, I hate to call them programs, but that's really the best word for it. But I, I, I really hate that word. But we did. We started a new program. Um, we, it, it, for lack of a better term right now, it's called an age out program. It, it, in, in the orphanages there, when they hit 18, they're gone. They're effectively put on the street because they age out of the orphanage. They have no family. They have no support. They have nothing else. So they're, they're left to fend for themselves. And we've been talking about this for a few months, and we developed a program to be able to take those young people on. Mostly young people from the north, mostly young people in our area that would have been lost their family due to Christian persecution. They, they all came from a very tough, tough situation, right? We would take them for three years, we would teach them a trade, we would give them university level classes, and we would teach them what it means to have relationship with Jesus Christ, how that affects every part of their life. And so we have this three-year plan, and I'm not going to go into it because I could preach the whole thing on that, but we're very excited about this. There's nothing out there like this, and there's such a need. Well, I figured we'd get this going in a few months, and God kind of snickered and said, no, I've already got this going for you. Be ready. We get up to Joss, and we met three of the first five that we'll have within a few weeks, <laughs> which is funny because we don't have a place for them yet. We, we have the family that can embrace them and love them, and honestly, that's all you need because the Lord is going to work out the rest of it. But I want to tell you about one young man. This young man had been in the orphanage for eight years. His name's Elisha. This young man was Muslim. I can't remember what state. I want to say he was from Borno. I can't remember, but it, his, he, he was in an area where Boko Haram hits very heavily. But remember, he was Muslim. His family is converted to Christianity. They received the Lord as Savior. And most of the village did that very thing. So sometime later, Boko Haram comes in, and, and at this time, he was... He's 20 now, so at this time he was 12 years old. Okay, imagine a 12-year-old kid. So Bokaram comes into the village and warns everybody, we're going to be back, and when we come back, if you do not renounce your Christianity, we will take your life. And after they left... Their family had a discussion, and the father decided, we won't really do it, but let's renounce our Christianity because then we can live. That, to me, sounds like a very normal reaction out of fear. Don't think, oh, wow, how could he ever do that? I think nine out of ten Christians would do that. Because, see, it's not just putting a gun to the, your head. It's not just making a nice, clean kill. No, their, their kills are dirty. They're mean. They're vicious. We've seen them. We've seen the scars from them. So they had this family discussion, and this young 12-year-old boy said, I can't do that, Dad. I promised Jesus my heart. I can't give it back. I can't give it to another. So his dad said, well, son, then you need to run. Twelve years old. Twelve years old. You need to run. You need to go. So he did. Even to this day, Eight years later, he's not seen his family. He believes they're dead. His escape 
was of God. He runs and is stopped by Bokaram. Oh, sorry, no. They sneak him out dressed as a girl. You know, with the, what's it called, a hubby? Or, uh, it's not a hubby. Huh? Head covering. Head covering. <laughs> Thank you for the English version. <laughs> he, hijab? Did I say that right? Thank you. Thank you. You are so much better than him. I will turn to you for answers. But anyways, they dressed him up as a girl and, and walking him, trying to get him out of the village and Bokaram stop him. See that, and he's with, I think, two other kids or something like that. They put him on their knees. They see he's a boy, obviously. They put him on their knees and each one, they say, get up and run. And, and I hope I'm remembering this in all the detail. Am I not? Okay, I'm getting pieces though, aren't I? Thank you. All right. Get up and run and they would get up and run and get shot in the back. And, oh, I, I think, yeah, I think I am for, forgetting something. That was toward the end, right? Okay. Rewind. Before that, he, go, he, he runs, and I know he was shot at twice because the guy next to him was actually killed, and then he was shot at, and he ran into this house and hid and was able to hide for a little bit, then ran into, went over to another house, knocked on the door. This lady answered, who was a Muslim lady. She took him in, and then she helped hide him until they left. She, he was there for a time until she said, let's try and get you out of the vision, village. A Muslim lady. So as they're going out of the village, I think that's when he was caught, right? Oh, am I mixing up? Okay, my, my bad. Okay, well, he was shot at twice, though. I do know that. <laughs> Anyways, I need, I need to write this stuff down. But bottom line is he was put in the position of absolute death as a 12-year-old. And all he had to do was say, no, I don't believe in Jesus. Would that have changed his salvation? No. Would that have changed his life? Yes. Because that choice did eventually drive him to where he is now at this orphanage. Well, actually, he's not at the orphanage anymore. He's staying at the director's house because he can't be at the orphanage anymore. This young man who is passionate for Jesus knows very little about it. But just that Jesus paid more than he ever chose to risk. See, these are the kids that are going to change Nigeria because they've already given everything. They've already chosen God. They've already been faced with the very thing that would choose, make them choose to run away. They've faced it. So I'm excited for what God's doing. I'm excited. The only thing that bothers me is, is, Lord, help us to keep up with the need. Because there's so much need out there. But the, the, I did just want to mention that program because we're going to talk about it more in the future. I, I, I really think that is a game changer there. But let's, let's pray because I do, I do want to get into this. Father, we worship you. We praise you. We love you. Thank you, God, that you have brought us all together again. Thank you, God, that you have purpose this morning. You have intent for us to increase confidence in who you are, in who you have made us to be. 
in what your son Jesus paid for and in what is to be that even though Satan may hold it, it's not his. And it will be taken from his hands. Father, fill my mouth with your Holy Spirit, with your words, none of my own. Do your will, none of mine. I desire only what you want. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So yesterday, at the gifts meeting, we talked about something that, at the time, I wasn't sure if the Lord would want that, but, uh, but I had a feeling that he was going to want to talk about it this morning. And so when I got up this morning and we were talking about it, it became very clear that this is something critical that the bride needs to know. Because this is not, this is not something that you just kind of learn and tuck away. This is something that if you're stepping on this battlefield, if you're going to, going to make any kind of difference for Jesus Christ, this better be in your understanding. You better have a handle on what this means. So I encourage you to write notes. I encourage you to write down these scriptures. I encourage you to even go back and, and listen to this podcast again. And I encourage you to put it out there. Share it. Get it to your friends. Get it to people that need it. Because this is the basis of understanding what an effective army is all about. This is literally how you guys were effective while we were there. We were talking about demonic possession yesterday. And what does that mean? And specifically, can that happen in a Christian? Can a Christian be demon-possessed? Now, I, I'm pretty sure that I've preached about this before. Um, I, I know I've talked about it before. I think I've actually preached a whole sermon about it before. But <clears throat> I think it, the timing is such that it needs to be gone through again because we're at a place of this battle where you have to know your authority. You have to understand what that means. You have to understand the enemy in order to defeat the enemy. Right? What general goes into a war not knowing who his enemy is? 90% of his time is not spent fighting the enemy, but learning the enemy. Knowing what the enemy does. Knowing the strategies which we're told in Ephesians 6 that the devil has strategies to defeat you, to defeat the bride, to halt everything that God is trying to do. So if we're wise, we'll put on that armor, as it says in Ephesians 6. If we're wise, we're going to begin to learn the strategies, or it says the wiles of the devil. First, it's to learn how he comes against you. And, and for some Christians, that's all the farther they get. And praise God, they get that far. Understanding that I'm in a battle for myself. I'm in a battle to fight against what the enemy's trying to do against me. You know what, though? He's calling you higher than that. He's calling you higher to take on a battle for those who do not even know that there's a war on. Do you understand? Because they need to see it. They need to be shown it. So we talked about this idea of demonic possession, and, and I was sent a video, and I, I probably was kind of cool and calm and collected about this until I saw the video. It was this well-known preacher talking about demonic possession and how, how it's so absurd and, and incorrect that 
a demon, there's no way a Christian can be demon possessed. And they started to lay out all this scripture as to why that is the case. Okay, so let's go through it. First of all, I want you to understand something. In this video, and, and, and I, I'm using the video as an example because it's probably, I mean, this is where I was. This is where I was for 40 years in my teaching, in my understanding. So, so in, in referring to that, that thought process, that video, I'm not just talking about that preacher, I'm talking about probably the majority of the bride. I don't know. I, I think conservatively, I could probably say 90%. It's probably higher than that, okay, of those who are saved. I don't know, maybe even some here. We'll see. I looked up the word possession in the dictionary, and possession talks about ownership, okay? Um, if you are in possession of something, it, 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 Webster's and all the others, they said the same thing. It's ownership. And that's the track that this preacher took. That possession is about ownership because it's about ownership. You are already owned by God. You cannot be owned by both, right? So I want you to turn because we can't have two owners effectively. But I, I want to, before that, define possession. Turn to Matthew 8, 16. By the way, I, I, I just, I wrote this down so I want to mention it because it bugs me. <laughs> Conservative Christians believe in the concept of peace through strength in a nation, right? I, I would say most believe that, right? We believe that. Peace through strength. That's what Reagan believed. It's what Trump believed, right? They'll leave us alone if you have strength. Why in the heck do Christians not understand that? Why don't they apply that to the spirit realm? Well, no, we'll, we'll just, you know, I know we have this target on our back, but if, if we stay low enough, he won't see us. Good night. How about get up stronger and put a shield on? How about stand up, do something, instead of taking it, why don't you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, give it? You go after the enemy. You can't win a war by defense. You could turn a war around with defense, but you can't win with defense. Because even defense that scores had to become offense. You understand? The only way you win is to take away from the enemy. Bottom line, no other way. You existing in your life to just make it through and looking forward to heaven, God. Man, you're doing yourself a disservice, but more than that, you're doing the bride a disservice. You're doing God a disservice. He wants you to understand that you have been called to be a part of an army that goes after these things, this peace through strength. So they say demonic possession means ownership. Okay, Ephesians 1.14, we've... Oh, wait, no, I said Matthew 8.16. I never did do that, did I? Okay, Matthew 8.16 says this. Uh, let me go to 15 just to give clarification. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. So this was, this was a healing. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. If you understand the Greek here, that word oppressed, which by the way, that's where people get, well, no, we're not possessed. We're oppressed. Okay, spelling does not change what you are. 
Spelling does not change the situation. That is not even what it means. If you look at the oppressed here, it is the same verbiage, the same tense, the same everything else of the other times. When the demonic was possessing a person. Okay? So let's turn to Ephesians 1.14. You all know this verse. I quote it enough. You should know it. Let's do 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. See, you have the Holy Spirit. When you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Everybody would agree with that, right? Okay, so... If you are then owned by the Holy Spirit, you can't be owned by somebody else. Let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9, talking about those who would believe in Jesus. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay? Again, we're owned by God. When we accept him as Savior, we're owned by him. I have no argument with that. We are a chosen people. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3.23. Uh, start at 21. So let no one boast in men, for all things are, are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. Okay, every time I read that verse, I, I have this picture of us being in Jesus' hands. And, and I, I remember as I was a younger man, I used to use this for eternal security, for, for, you know, telling the enemy when he's fighting me about my own salvation, I said, wait a second, I am in Jesus' hands, and he's cupped me like this. And where is he? He's in the Father's hands that's cupped around his hands. What do you think the chances are of me getting out? More than that, what do you think the chances are of Satan getting in? How about zero? Zero. Because I am God's. So clearly, we are owned by God if we are saved. So the question then becomes... Can we, who are owned by God, have a demon? Turn to 1 John 4.4. 4. First John 4.4 4 says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Overcome who? Demonic spirits. You've overcome the world. You have overcome his, the enemy's influence. Okay? You've overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. <laughs> that was the biggest verse that this preacher used to say you cannot be demonically possessed as a Christian. Because you are already owned by God and he deemed it as then a competition between God and Satan and God wins every time, so Satan loses every time. It cannot happen. Problem is he's equating the wrong thing. Turn to Luke chapter 11. And by the way, let me, just, let me just make this note 
because I want you to go back. I want you to study these things. I want you to read them, but I just have one little question that used to bug me. Okay, if, if I am God, then Satan can't touch me. Okay, he can oppress me, but he can't, he can't, he can't get his grips on me, right? If that's the case, then why did John add those first three verses in John chapter 4? Why is he warning us of what the world does? Warning us of engagement with them? Warning us of testing the very spirits that will come against us? That's what he said there. Let, let's read it. Behold, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God or many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Okay, he's trying to tell you to discern the spirit realm, to discern the spirits that come after you. Okay, why? Okay, if you're owned by God and Satan can't do anything, why do you need to be able to discern? Yeah, Rich, you had a question. Sorry, I went back to 1 John 4. And, and I read the first three verses, or first two verses, I guess. Okay. So then, again, I, I, I'm, I'm on this idea of ownership, and I, and I know I'm kind of pushing it a little bit here. Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter, or wait, did, we didn't do Luke, did we? Okay, Luke 11, let's just do this. Because it shows how the demonic works. Luke 11, verse 24, says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, in other words, an unclean spirit is cast out or dejected out of a person. It passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Why, why is it swept and put in order? Because it's not there anymore. The demonic spirit is what brings the chaos. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. Okay, then Matthew 16, verse 23 Jesus has an interesting reaction here to Peter. You know, when Jesus is saying, I'm going to, you know, be put on a cross, Peter turned to him and said, or, or Peter said, no, no, this shouldn't far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Okay, now I'm not arguing that Peter was possessed, but you can't argue that he wasn't being used. How many Christians are being used like that because of their ignorance of the spirit realm, their ignorance of what's really going on on that battlefield, and Jesus called it out. He, Jesus didn't look above Peter's head and said, Satan, or look down to the ground. Satan, no, he looked at Peter because that's where the declaration came from. It was out of Peter's mouth that those words were spoken that had weight. And lastly, turn to 1 Corinthians 6. Again, you are owned by God. And when God owns you, you become his temple. And, and so, so the Holy Spirit and a demonic spirit can, cannot invade the same place, right? They cannot be co-owners, if you will. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18 says this, 
Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. You're owned by God. Therefore, your body is his holy temple when you accept Jesus Christ into your heart. You are owned by him. So what he's saying here is don't go out and pollute it. So wait a second. Something doesn't make sense here. Because if possession had anything to do with ownership, then why is God telling you not to be sexually immoral? If you're already owned by God, that shouldn't even be a, a, an opportunity. Shouldn't even be the case. You should no longer have the choice. The problem is you are owned by God. But possession is not ownership. Even Webster's got this wrong. Webster says possession is ownership, and yet the law says it's only nine-tenths of the law. Right? Possession is not ownership. Anybody in today's age should know that. I'm curious. How many of you have cars that have a loan on it? Just raise your hand. Okay, seriously, people. I know y'all got cars that have loans. Or, or you have a mortgage. Okay, let's try that one. Thank you. All you guys owning your cars outright, you need to start taking my finances. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, so you have a mortgage. Do you own your home? No. You, you have ownership rights of your home. You can make decisions as long as you're paying your bill. But ultimately, who owns your home? It's your creditor. It's who you owe the money to. So, so wait a second. Does your bank live in your third bedroom? No. Okay. Do they come and do they have a little booth out, out by your, your driveway that, that says, you know, we, we have ownership here? Okay. So what you're telling me is the bank does not possess your home, correct? But they own your home. Okay. Okay. Maybe that gives us a little clearer understanding of what possession really is. Possession is not about ownership. Possession is this, and the Lord had me write it down, so I want you to write it down. Possession is simply control and authority to control. To what extent control is given or achieved? You didn't get that that fast? All right, you want me to repeat that? All right. Possession is simply control and authority to control. And then he had me put a dash and it said, to what extent control is given or achieved? See, sometimes we give control. But sometimes control is manipulated from us. That's why Satan goes after little kids. That's why you see kids that go through a traumatic thing when they're five years old. And they're dealing with something that an adult shouldn't have to deal with. And what it does is, it, it doesn't mean that they're in sin for that. But it's in that agreement of fear that begins to open doors for Satan to come in and gain control because of authority. Because of their agreement with that fear. So that control can be gained just by us giving it, but it can also be gained through manipulation. So in reality, possession 
is us giving control of something in us to something else. By the way, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's just supposed to be in the other direction. We're supposed to give control, just not to Satan, just not to the demonic. We're supposed to give control to God. He purchased us with a price. We accept his free gift. But then us building relationship with him is us saying, here, have my life. I give you my yes. I step in obedience. You've called me to this. I step in that obedience and do it. So I walk in that agreement. And what I'm doing is giving him control. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, giving, you know, every time I pray up here, it's like, you speak through me. I don't want to speak myself, right? I'm giving control to the Holy Spirit. When you wake up in the morning and you say yes to Jesus Christ, whatever you have for me today, God, whatever you have, I want to walk in it. What you're declaring right there in that moment is I give you control of my choices. I give you control of my life. Well, no, let me back up. I don't mean choices like, here, you have my choices, I'll never make a choice again. I don't mean that. I mean when you're presented with a choice, you are giving, you are making him his, you know, your choice. Whatever he wants, that is what you're wanting. This is a constant declaration. It's not a one-time thing like justification of sin, like salvation, this is an everyday thing. It's like building relationship with him is an everyday thing. Okay, so, so in reality, what is possession then? Possession is something that is not zero or 100%. Okay, it's not you're either not or you fully are. We have a very myopic view of what possession is here in the States. You know, we all think of possession, some of you may, may be too young to really know what this is or remember it, but the exorcist, you know, when we think of possession, well, it's the exorcist. You know, if you're possessed, your head's going to spin all the way around, <laughs> right? You're going to puke up green whatever it was, right? That, that's possession. I mean, the possession is so obvious, it's ridiculous. Really? No. Look at the most possessed in the word of God. It will be the man of lawlessness, and yet the whole world will embrace him. The whole world will believe him. He, he is so good at a lie that everybody will believe, except the elect, who thankfully will be taken. All right? He, he knows. I mean... This is not about head spinning and green throw up. Don't, don't be so myopic on, on your view of possession. It's control of your choices. Have you ever had something that you knew you weren't supposed to do in your life, but you tried it? Oh, dude, that wasn't so bad, you know. Try it again. Then you try it again. Then you try it again. Then you try it again. Till it comes to the point where you're not making that choice anymore. It controls you. This can apply to every area of life. You know, the, the ones that are obvious, you know, an alcoholic that has chosen that first drink and, and then yeah, that wasn't so bad. I, you know, I survived. Then they had another, then they had another. And then they find themselves owned by it, controlled by it. How about the drug addict? I remember, man, drugs scared me when I was a kid. They, honestly, I'll tell you what kept me in line when I was a kid. Maybe I shouldn't preach this, but fear. I mean, fear. I, I, I thought... I remember as a kid, I had no idea about demonic or anything else. I mean, really understood it. Not positive I believed it. But 
I was afraid of letting anything else control me. That I did know. That I did know. I, I didn't need to drink. I didn't need to have drugs because I could be stupid enough all on my own. <laughs> and, and what's funny is I was crazier than most of my friends. You know, most of my friends that got drunk, I'm, I'm like, come on, guys, you're boring. I mean, really. So, so for me, it was that fear. Thank you, Lord, for that fear that kept me from that. But how easy is it to fall into an addictive thing? So we know, okay, we know the alcoholism. We know, we know the drugs. You know, we know the sexual addiction. We know these things that are so obvious. Okay, how about food? How about food? Ouch. Yeah. How about when something controls you that you don't think is real, oh, it's just not that bad. Until it owns you to a point where it stops everything that you do. It consumes your mind. It could be anything. It could be anything. Now, here's the problem I have with this possession deal. If you do not believe, if you do not believe that Christians can be possessed, if you think of it as an ownership issue instead of a control issue, then right away you have to believe that anybody with any addictive problem at all cannot be saved. Okay, that, that's really going to mess you with your head right there. Because if they were saved, now you've got to believe they could lose their salvation. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. That's not possible. Okay, so then I'll fall back on what I, I used to teach. Well, they really never were saved in the first place. I, I'll tell you what, guys. God did not raise a high bar for salvation he didn't give us a list of 100 things that we need to accomplish in order to be justified by faith. It was justified by faith, not by a list. Amen. We were justified by faith. We were justified by literally believing in who he is and what he did on the cross and what the Holy Spirit did in raising him from the grave. And then saying, yes, you are my Messiah. I receive you. Come into my heart. That's it. That's a pretty low bar. I mean, we could do that. We don't have to be physically fit to do that. We don't have to go to Nigeria to do that. We don't even have to get out of bed to do that. In, in fact, I, I think I was in my bed when I accepted Jesus Christ, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember for me, man, it, you know, I don't like fear, and, and now, praise God, I don't have to deal with it, but, but I think it, fear drove me to a lot of things when I was a kid. I remember hearing a, a message on hell, and I was nine years old. I thought, yep, don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, Lord. I talked to my mom on my bed. Mom, I am not going to bed. We're going we're gonna to deal with this right now. And it was done. That's a low bar, guys. I didn't have to go to college for it. I didn't have to learn for it. Salvation, justification of faith is a, is a low bar. God made it that way on purpose. Why? Because it was taken by force. It was taken from God. It was taken from man. His creation that was supposed to be in relationship to him and stewarding his creation. It was taken so that upset the Lord enough to come and pay everything. He paid everything for us to receive. All we have to do is believe. But the truth is, that's just the beginning. That's not the end. That's like the entry fee. That, that's, like, that's like you paying 60 bucks to go down to Six Flags to get in the gate and just sitting at the gate. What's the point? What's the point of that? What's at the gate? You, you could buy a stuffed animal. I, you might be able to get an ice cream. I haven't been there in a while. Okay, but you're not going to ride a ride. 
You're not going to get the thrill of what the park even does or even means or anything else. You have to go into the park. You have to get on the ride. Sometimes you've got to wait in the line. Boy, isn't that the tough part? The patience. The patience of, of waiting in the line to finally get on the ride. But if all you do is sit at the gate, you don't know anything about the park. You don't know anything about relationship with him. He set the bar low. Because the fight is really between you and Satan and his forces. Not between God. God already won his war. He already paid for what was stolen. Now he needs the bride who was supposed to be his partner. That's what Adam and Eve were supposed to be. In partnership with God. To steward what God had created. To his glory. And they failed. They gave it away. He gave it away. Thank God for redemption. Because even they had the redemption after that. But truth is, we're still supposed to do that. Do you think God, oh man, I screwed up and, you know, trusted Adam and Eve and they messed up. Okay, forget it. You know, we're, we're just going to go to plan B. You think God did that? No, no, no. God doesn't have a plan B. God pushes till his plan A is fulfilled. His plan A is to be fulfilled in his bride. Don't keep waiting for the rapture. How about, how about get yourself involved in the bride, get yourself involved in this war, and like the Bible says, bring it on quicker. Because his intent to the bride to steward this earth will happen. It will happen. It's what he wants to happen. And there is a force that comes against that. I got to tell you this, and, and I do want to get into one more thing, but he had me write this down, and it's indicative of the church today. Remember I said the bar was set so low with salvation. The problem is churches keep that bar low for relationship. They, they figure, here, just get this, just get over this first little bar and we won't worry about you anymore because you're in, you got your ticket. And the whole time, they're not teaching them how to ride the rides. They're not teaching them how to enjoy what God has for them. Even worse, they're not teaching them that they're to fight for others. So the God, God gave me a word for those churches. Just a sentence, really. He said, my bride... Come out of your immaculately constructed and beautifully adorned mega tombs and serve me. He says, My bride, come out of your immaculately constructed and beautifully ordained, adorned, sorry, mega tombs and serve me. Guys, this isn't about a big church. A church with 20,000 people that does nothing is an impotent church. In fact, it's more powerfully against the bride than for the bride. If you understand that possession is simply control then you're on your way to understanding what it means to fight. What it means to fight in your own life. What it means to fight for others. And as you build your relationship with Jesus Christ, the very purity that he builds in your life is what scares the enemy. It, it, it's, it's like, I believe it was the sons of Sceva that you know, went out and tried to cast these demons out or whatever, and, 
And, and they're like, well, we know Jesus and we know Paul. We don't know you. Bam, 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 bam. And they got the snot beat out of them. Okay, do you think it was because they had a malicious intent? No, I don't. I think it was because they were ignorant that there's a cost to that authority. That authority does not just come from having a piece of paper that allows me to get in to the park. That piece of paper allows me to then receive the authority. The authority comes from walking in that purity. If it didn't, why does he keep warning us to walk in his purity? If the authority automatically came from accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, then why do I have to deal with all the things I deal with? Why do Christians have to deal with an addiction to pornography, an addiction to alcohol, drugs, anything else? Why? Wait a second, we're saved. Wait, wait, we're owned by God. Why do, we, why do we have to deal with it? It's because none of those things have to do with authority. Authority is something earned. It's not something achieved because it is given, but it is earned. It is earned through your obedience. You see it in John chapter 15, where Jesus said, you began, to, he was talking to his disciples, he said, you began as my servants, but through your obedience you have become my friends. I call you my friend. And the best thing a friend could do, a best friend is one who would give his life. John chapter 15 is one of my favorite chapters. See, it was earned. That label of friendship was earned. It was not given just because they, he said, follow me. And they said, okay, yeah, friends. No, it's not what Jesus said. He said, you were my servants. But through your obedience, you have become my friends. You want power in this battlefield? You want power in this war, in this army? Submit yourself to him. Say yes every day. Let him build in you that purity which comes from your yes. It's not you having a list of 100 things that if I do these things or I don't do these things, I'm going to be pure. If I could just stay away from that computer, then, then I'll be pure. No, how about kill the stinking thing that is tempting you to go there? Learn to go after that. Learn to fight at the source. Don't fight walking backward. It's always a loss. You're better off turning and running. I, I was always taught that. I won't tell you when, but I was taught that. If you're in a fight, don't punch back and up. Because you have... 80% more force if you're going forward because your entire body weight is going into it. It's the same in the spirit realm. Don't run away from the enemy. Go after him at his source. But the truth is that has to be from decisions in your heart. It has to come from a pure yes. Yes. If your whole reason to go after the enemy that comes and fights you in temptation or, or whatever is because I want relief, well, I mean, you may get some relief, but you're not going to get the power from that. The power comes from that yes. That's what allows you to then fight for others to be a part of an army that makes a difference. And man, I, it'll just take a minute. I'm not going to look them all up, but I want to tell you these things because, okay, if you really want to understand possession, possession is control, but it's not a residing 
in a person's spirit. Okay, who are we? We are body, soul, spirit. What is the soul? Soul is our mind, right? So we're body, mind, and spirit. Our spirit is sealed when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Our spirit it was, is what goes on, right? Okay? Our mind or our soul is what we operate with to say yes. Our body is fallen flesh. Soon to be one day transfigured. Who knows when? But one day. So really what we're dealing with is a choice between our will and God's will in our mind to decide what happens. Okay, that's what we're giving to the Lord. Our spirit is already his. Our spirit has ownership. He, he is owned he owns our spirit. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit, that's ac actually a misnomer. I, I know we use that term and, and you know, it makes sense to us and, and all that, but it's really a, a misnomer. There are three terms that are used in the Word of God in the New Testament that refer to the Holy Spirit and its interaction with us. Three terms, okay? There is, <clears throat> and, and by the way, anybody that wants this, I could give you these notes later, but there is, um, there is, um, uh, I don't want to read through all this here. Um, there is means with you. There is N, which is E N which means in you or inside you. And by the way, that's what happens when we accept Christ as Savior. But there are only a few instances where the third one is found and it is always combined with a strange consequence. And that is the Greek term epi. Epi means upon you. It's found in Acts 1, chapter 8, 10, chapter 44, and 19, verse 6. Epi in the Greek means to rest upon. When they were filled in the upper room, the Holy Spirit rested upon them. All right? They said yes. Jesus said, go and wait in the upper room. They said yes. They went. They waited. And the Holy Spirit came and rested upon them. Right? Same thing that happened in creation, by the way. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The Holy Spirit brooded upon the waters. It was the same meaning in the Hebrew. Where the Holy Spirit affected what was going on through literally engulfing it. Controlling it. Wait a second. That's kind of sounding like possession. Possession. See, it's no different. You can give your control to the enemy or you can give your control to God. Same thing. Same process. Very different results. But understand that demonic possession is not ownership. Don't let the church lie to you in that. It is not. And, and why do they do that? I, it, maybe lie is a strong word. If they understand that Christians can be demonically possessed, they will realize that they have dropped a ball for a long, long time. They will realize all of a sudden that they have a responsibility that they never knew they had. The thing is, they need to know. Because... It's not a hard thing to fight. It takes time, just like being in school. It takes time to learn, right? You go through the bumps and bruises and you deal with stuff, just like Paul did. Paul had that demon. He prayed three times, take it from me. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. Keep fighting. He let him stay to fight so Paul could learn. But it is simply by saying yes that those demonic 
attacks will be met with such force that they cannot withstand. See, you're supposed to have this in your life to where it doesn't just fight in your life, but it fights for the lives around you. That's why God starts with a remnant. Because the remnant is supposed to rise to fight for those who are not. I encourage you today, don't be afraid of what demonic possession means because every Christian, get this, every Christian has experienced it. Everyone. There's not a single one who is not. At whatever level, every single one has. Don't be afraid of that. Start running into the fight. Punch moving forward, not backward. Alex, come on up. There's so much more that can be unpacked in this subject. Um, I do hope you'll listen to it again. I, um, I think that one of the verses that um, I want to also add to your, your list that is so important is uh, 2 Corinthians 10. Really starting at 3, but 3, 4, and 5. Those are the ones that I always um, go to when it comes to the war with the enemy. Because remember, he starts with a suggestion he starts with a thought, and you see it manifesting even in the human realm. There's an idea first. There's a redefinition of language, then an idea and a suggestion that maybe you're not fully a woman. Maybe you could be a, a fluid gender, and you know all of these suggestions. And the moment that there's agreement with a thought, those thoughts then agreed with affect decisions made that then an action follows that decision and before you know it you're literally operating in a lie in deception and in falseness and the pathway to evil and so without second corinthians 10 3 4 and 5 and pull it up if you don't mind just so that it's just in front of us we don't wage war after the flesh, though we operate and walk humanly after the flesh. Our war, as clearly described, is not in the flesh. It is in the spirit. And if we don't cast down, um, the ESV is a great translation. I always quote it from the King James, but ESV is fine. Um, and you can go to four, because I already said that one. Um, if we don't cast down these, the weapons of our warfare have, uh, of, that are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Go to five. The, we destroy, or in the King James it says casting down, uh, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion, it's, which is where it starts. It starts with even just listening and entertaining what the enemy is saying. And those opinions are always raised against the knowledge of God. And when we at the thought level reject it and fundamentally know I'm not going to let those thoughts influence me, they are cast down, they are held captive unto the obedience of Christ. That's where so much of the victory is won. If you don't want a hard road, man, take your thoughts captive. Watch what you feed on. Um, so many stories and testimonies. I even heard one in Nigeria of, of a man um, who had one opportunity as a child that he was uh, introduced to debauchery on a sexual level. And he said, before I even knew what was happening, I was, I was sucked into it. And it, it affected me then in my decision-making, which then followed an act. And then that act gave an authority not only of that sin, but of shame that lasted decades and carried with, was carried with him a life of destruction because he never knew how to deal with it. Um, I've heard that in people's stories and testimonies of, of drugs, that one suggestion of trying it, no impact, and they entertained the thought and for a moment believed that maybe it wouldn't be so bad. And then upon trying it, their life was forever changed. So how do, you, how do you withstand these suggestions? Well, one of them is to be so fully 
in tune with and close to your Savior. That when a lofty and proud argument rises its head against that knowledge of Jesus, you're so familiar with the knowledge of Jesus that you just immediately recognize the counterfeit. They say that about bills, about cash. You don't study the various counterfeits. You study the original. So that any form of counterfeit that comes along is just like, yeah, this is a fake. Yeah, get out of here. You know, I hold it up against the standard of the authentic. And that's what relationship with Jesus does. It gives us the authentic. It gives us that, that closeness. And, and, and I'm not talking just about the, the conscious awareness. I'm talking about sometimes in our spirits, when our minds get overwhelmed or we're in the middle of things, it's, it's the closeness with Jesus that we can literally, we, we, before our minds can even identify it, we feel the squeeze in our spirit that something's off. We're discerning something. We're, we're discerning a don't go in there. We're, I'll never forget, even as a help to me, I pulled in late at night, early on in our marriage, I pulled in late at night to a, a, some sort of a little market or something, and I immediately felt a squeeze in my spirit that I was not to get out of the car, not at all. And I remember that when I, I just, I, I thought there's something, I just, I needed to shut the door. I just, there was just, there was something, yes, I shut the door and I left. I immediately left. And I heard later things that had happened there that could have, I could have been pulled into, but the Lord just, he, he threw that squeeze, just protected me. So it's not always just a, about a moral issue. Sometimes it is a protection issue. It's just abiding in the secret place of the Most High. And by the way, in Psalm 91, verse 8, which we've mentioned in the ladies' class, it is all these things listed up until verse 8 that, that the Word says in the Amplified that are we that are inaccessible. We are inaccessible to these things because of the covering and because of the shadow of the Almighty that we abide under. So don't buy into the religious philosophy that, well, if you constantly, you know, if, it, it's not good to be studying your enemy because then that's devil-focused and it's not Jesus-focused. You just need to be Jesus-focused and not devil-focused. Okay, that's a twisting of the truth. Of course you're supposed to be Jesus focused. That's all it is. That's all it's about. It's about learning and growing in relationship with Jesus. But in that Jesus focus, you will learn the strategies of your enemy. So it's not like it's a one or the other, but you'll learn it in the right way. It's not delving into Satanism just so that I'm not, you know, sucked into Satanism. No, don't take that upon yourself. As you abide in the secret place of the Most High, guess what? God will show you the wiles of the devil, to avoid. He will keep you from the snare of the fowler, from the young lion and the adder. The young lion, when it doesn't have as many devastating consequences, and it might even be something you can pet without devastating hits to you, it's the young lion that we sometimes don't discern. But in the secret place, in relationship with Jesus, he shows us, yeah, don't mess with that. That's going to grow into a monster. Run now. Stay away. Leave like Joseph did, even if you leave your garment into the temptation, tempter's hands. Run and flee. These are the kind of things. So, so there's so many things in the bride. I just wanted to add that because um, I've heard my whole life from, from preachers that I truly respect and even now respect that won't teach spiritual warfare. They won't teach deliverance ministry issues because they think it's a devil focus rather than a Jesus focus. And, um, and those are not mutually exclusive. There, there is, um, there is a, an understanding and a wisdom given in the Jesus focus when we are learning because Jesus would not have us be ignorant of the fight. He wants us to be more than conquerors. That's what he promised us. So, um, so this is an important word. You want to clarify something? Okay. <laughs> That's good. You don't usually... I know, I know, and then, then I'll, I'll have you pray. But I, I did want to clarify something because we talked today primarily about possession. That does not mean there isn't oppression. That does not mean that, that Satan only takes when there's authority. He is also a thief. And we did not talk about that today. I don't want you to think that, well, okay, there's a lot that comes against me, so I must be possessed. That's not it. That's not it at all. 
Because Satan does come to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? Steal. He will send things against you that he has no authority to do. It's still the same fight. It's still the same war. But I, I just wanted to clarify, that is not what we talked about today. Because we have many in here. I mean, for, for that matter, me being gone in, in Nigeria for those, those 10 days, those two weeks. Was it, was it because, you know, I deserved to have that? No. It was because I was standing on a battlefield where there was artillery coming at me. Okay, that's, that's where we're supposed to be. We're, we're going to take hits. So I just wanted to be clear that that's not what we were talking about today because there is real oppression. There is real theft coming against the bride as well. We encouraged our team that was with us um, in that very area that um, there's nothing like fighting a battle, especially if it's legal. And remember everything about how the enemy hits us. You look through the judicial lens of, of the word of God, and there's nothing like fighting a battle when you know you're absolutely innocent. The fight, the confidence, the boldness you have when you're innocent. If you're fighting a legal battle because you know you did wrong and you're just trying to minimize the, the suffering, that's a whole different kind of battle. So like he said, uh, it doesn't mean you sometimes don't get unlawfully hit with certain things that you still have to deal with in the courts of heaven. Um, but when you know that you are in right standing with God and that you are innocent um, because you've lived in purity and because you're walking with him, um, it, is, it is a much easier battle in the sense of your victory all the time. So let's pray. And um, this probably won't be the only time that we will be dealing with this. In, in um, This is just the, the first of... of the topic, but there's, there's so much more. But dig deep, dig deep, and get some good revelation from the Lord directly from his word as you, as you seek him. Father, thank you. Thank you, God, that you, you are such a good, good father. You are a gentle teacher, God. You, you guide by your spirit so that we can triumph always in every situation. Thank you for your armor. Thank you that you have given us so much to be victorious in. And thank you, Jesus, that you're our advocate, that you stand with us, that you are for us and not against us. Thank you for all these amazing promises, God, that we don't have to be discouraged or in despair, but that we can always rise in confidence and boldness, even when the battle is at its most intense um, times. And God, we just praise you for that. I just worship you. Thank you for the power in worship alone that when you are magnified, God, that when there is a, a pouring out of our hearts and that we believe you for that closeness that you offer, we do become impervious in that place of faith and rest, as you had Bryn share last week, that place of rest that causes the enemy at some point to just not want to spend any more resources because he just can't get through because we're just so completely wrapped in you. Not just in our justification, but in our sanctification, in our faith levels, because we trust you on every turn. So I praise you for that, God. And I pray that you would help us to grow and um, increase our trust and our faith. And Lord, to even pray that prayer, we know that that faith and that trust will only increase in times when trust and faith is needed. So that means we will have to face things where the choice is presented before us. We shrink back in fear or we decide to trust you. But every time we trust, there is such a great reward, great blessing. So God, I know we need that. And I thank you. I thank you for all the times that my flesh hated. Because now I, I see who you've been in my life. I see who you are to me. I see the provider that you have been and are presently. I see the protector, the defender, the restorer, the redeemer. God, all of the things that you've done in my life in times when I wouldn't have seen that part of your character had I not faced what I faced. And God, you are my victor. You are my banner. And I thank you, God. You are my healer. Whatever even hasn't manifested yet, I thank you, with a bold declaration, you are the healer of everything that is needing to be healed because I live in the wholeness of the kingdom of heaven. 
So I just praise you for that. God, let us rise to know who we really are and where we really reside, which is in the kingdom. Help us to seek that first.